So perhaps you heard that they're redefining what a kilogram is. Well, that's exciting. Turns out they're doing much more than that. They're redefining all of the SI units, or almost all of the SI units, those units that define measurable reality, those units which include the meter, the second, the kilogram, things that we use every day, also the mole, the candela, the kelvin, and the ampere, things that might be a little bit less familiar. So let's talk about units and let's talk about this new definition and let's talk about why it's better than the old definition. And in order to understand why, well, we're going to have to go down the rabbit hole a little bit. But first, let's start not with mass, not with the kilogram, but with length and time, with the definition of a meter and the definition of a second. We'll take the second first. What is time? Well, time is related to the motion of the Earth, right? The Earth is spinning around, and when the Earth spins 360 degrees, that's a day. We have day and night. Is that right? Well, Yes, that's absolutely right, but it gets a little bit more complicated. There's a difference between the time it takes for high noon to go around and become a high noon again. That's called a solar day, and that's different than time as measured from the distant stars because the Earth is going around the sun as it is spinning. There's different types of motion. So we have a solar day, which is about 24 hours on average, and the sidereal day, which is four minutes less. That's why the stars in the nighttime sky change from season to season. It gets more complicated even than that, though, because the Earth's orbit around the sun is not a circle. It's an ellipse. So sometimes the Earth is going a little bit faster and traveling more of an angle around its elliptical orbit during the perihelion during the winter in January and sometimes it's going a little bit slower so sometimes it takes the sun a little bit longer than 24 hours to get back to noon and sometimes it takes a little bit less time so using the rotation of the earth to define a second it gets a little complicated a better idea might be to use some physical system like a mass on a spring or maybe a pendulum and those ideas have been tried they have some problems in themselves i mean how are you going to make sure that the springs are the same or the lengths of the ropes are the same or that you're using the same acceleration due to gravity which could vary depending on where you are on earth a physical system that's better than a mass on a spring or a pendulum could be the cesium atom, there it is in the lower left-hand corner of the periodic table. Hi, cesium. Cesium is an alkali metal. That means it's got just one outer electron in that final shell. We'll ignore all the inner electrons and just take a look at the nucleus and that outer electron because quantum mechanics is a thing. The nucleus and the outer electron both act like tiny magnets. Well, one's tinier than the other anyway. The electron is in the magnetic field of the nucleus, and the electron has a choice. It can either be oriented one way or the other way, one way or the other way, and this second orientation has a little bit less energy associated with it. How much less? Well, the answer can be found by letting the cesium atom go from one state to the other. It will emit radiation that will oscillate 9,192,631,770 times in one second. And that is the definition of a second. A nice physical system. Everybody should have the same cesium. Everybody should be on the same page. We'll define it a little bit differently, though. Instead of saying that one second is this many oscillations of cesium, we'll say that the frequency of this cesium oscillation, this 133 cesium oscillation called the hyperfine splitting frequency, anyway, is what you see on the screen there. And that V is not a V. It's the Greek letter nu, and it stands for frequency. You could use a cursive F, but we'll use the Greek letter nu. Greek letters are cool. That is the definition of the frequency of this radiation emitted by cesium during this particular hyperfine transition. That is where we get a definition, the current definition, of a second. What about the meter? Well, one definition of the meter is one ten millionth of the distance from the North Pole to the equator through France. And that's a pretty good definite. Would that work? Let's see. The uh, radius of the Earth is 6,400 kilometers. So you take 2 pi r and then you divide by 4. Would you get 10,000 kilometers? Yeah, it, it works pretty well. But turns out the Earth has mountains. The Earth also is not a perfect sphere. It's pretty close, but not perfect. So this isn't the best way to define a meter. Another way would be to use that pendulum we were talking about, and that method was used in the 1790s. 
the length of a meter was defined as the length of a pendulum that completes half of its swing in one second. And there's the equation for the period of a pendulum. So let's see if the length is one meter, one divided by 9.8, then you take the square root of that, and then you multiply by two pi. Would that give you about two seconds? I guess it would. But again, the problem with that is that the acceleration due to gravity cannot be super precisely known in advance. So instead of having these pendulums all around, they decided to make a meter stick. Fancy that, a meter stick. That was the definition of a meter in 1795, this piece of brass. In the 20th century, however, the definition of a meter was changed to the distance that light travels in just about one three hundred millionth of a second. I tried hard to pronounce that fraction a couple of different ways, but I'll just go with about one three hundred millionth, and there's the figure for you. So, the good news is that now the definition of the meter does not depend on a particular stick, which would be a little bit disconcerting. Let's say that somehow, I don't know, that the brass shrunk or that some vandal cut it in half overnight. You'd wake up and you would be twice as tall. Think about that. that. If that's the definition of length, if that stick, that brass meter stick was cut in half, you would then be twice as tall, even though your real height didn't change. The bad news is that I now need to measure the speed of light in order to know how tall I am which sounds kind of strange, but we can measure the speed of light. One method is using a rotating mirror. Light beams bounce back and forth a very far distance between a fixed mirror and a rotating mirror, and the speed of light was found to be 299,792,458 meters per second. But here's the deal. That was not the measured speed of light. That was defined in the mid-20th century, defined as the speed of light. Now, how can you do that? How can you go around defining the speed of light? Isn't that something that nature is supposed to define? Aren't you getting a little bit above your pay grade here? Well, remember how we defined a meter. We defined a meter based on the speed of light. How very circular of us. So here's what we're doing. We're noticing that there are things in nature that are very regular, very predictable. One of them is this cesium atom with this strange thing, its outer electron does another thing that is very regular is the speed of light in a vacuum. And we're using this to help us define our units. But here's the deal. What do you want to define and know with certainty? And what do you want to keep as uncertain? If you have a piece of wood or a piece of brass that is exactly one meter, then you will measure the speed of light using that standard and you'll be a little bit uncertain about the speed of light or you could define the speed of light and know that with certainty because that's your definition. The thing then though is you don't know exactly how long this piece of brass is or exactly how long this meter stick is. I mean you know it's a meter for all intents and purposes but you don't know exactly. So there is one thing that's defined and one thing that's measured. If you're defined, no uncertainty. You're doing good. If you're measured, there has to be some uncertainty. So what do you want? Well, I don't, I'm asking you, what do you want? Do you want the meter stick to be defined and the speed of light to be uncertain or the speed of light to be defined and the length of this particular piece of brass or piece of wood to be a little bit... I dilate on that point because that is what this lesson is all about and that's what the redefinition of the kilogram is all about. So what do you want to be uncertain? Well, here's another question. Do you want the mass of a particular chunk of metal to be certain, to be defined as a kilogram, or do you want Planck's constant to be defined? Which one of these do you want to be defined, and which one of these do you want to be a little bit uncertain? Well, let me explain what Planck's constant is. It is involved with the energy of a photon at a given frequency. Energy is equal to Planck's constant times frequency, and I guess now I'm using a cursive F for frequency, so okay, I'm being a little bit inconsistent here. Anyway, Planck's constant, a good number, very small, times 10 to the negative 34th joule seconds. So Planck's constant has something to do with energy. It's all about energy. And we already have definitions of time and distance. And since we have time and distance, we have definitions, good definitions for velocity and frequency. So if we know energy, we can define mass. Or if we know energy, we can define force. We have the work energy theorem. So if we know energy, if we have a definition of energy and we know velocity and frequency, we can get a definition of mass or a definition of force. We have the work energy theorem. We're familiar with that. You can use one of the equations on the sheet, kinetic energy, gravitational potential energy, spring potential energy. You can use whichever one you want. Now, not the latest and greatest and most current, but a decent way of 
finding Planck's constant would be to use the photoelectric effect. Here, high frequency, short wavelength, ultraviolet light is shown on a piece of metal and that the electrons that are ejected can be measured. Their energies, their velocities, and kinetic energies can be measured by placing them in a electric field by establishing a potential difference with a battery so, so we can get a measurement for Planck's constant and thereby define what a kilogram is. Or we can define the kilogram to be a specific hunk of metal. What about temperature? Well, one way of defining temperature, the old way of defining temperature, was to use the triple point of water. A new way is to define the Boltzmann's constant. So again, you can either have a perfect certainty, you can define what the triple point of water is, and then use that to measure Boltzmann's constant, or you can define what Boltzmann's constant is, and then use that to get a value for the triple point of water. Now, the previous definition of a Kelvin was 1 273.16 of the temperature of the triple point of water. Now we have a new definition, the definition having to do with Boltzmann's constant, and Boltzmann's constant gives us the energy of a molecule of gas at a given temperature. Boltzmann's constant is pretty small, although not as small as Planck's constant. There is an interesting history behind Boltzmann and Planck. They knew each other and their constants, and you can look that up anyway. By setting the value for Boltzmann's constant as the new definition of a Kelvin, we now make the definition of a Kelvin dependent on energy, which, is mean, which means it's dependent on mass and distance and time. The old definition of a Kelvin was just dependent on the triple point of water, so we're redefining lots of things. And Boltzmann's constant deals with the energy of an ideal gas. So you can imagine a container of gas, or you can even set up in the laboratory a container of gas, and you can perform experiments on it. You'll establish the ideal gas law, or you'll observe the ideal gas law if you do that. Increase the pressure on that gas at constant temperature, and the volume will decrease. Increase the temperature of that gas at constant pressure, and the volume will increase, or increase the number of particles in that container of gas and the volume will increase at constant pressure and constant temperature. Not all these particles, however, are moving at the same speed. It's kind of like a mosh pit. Some are moving slower, some are moving faster, most are moving at an intermediate speed, and we can find that's a terrible equation there. That's the Maxwell-Boltzmann speed distribution law. We've got lots of stuff, but what do, we, what, what, what do we have here? We have temperature, check. We have mass, check. We have R, R, the ideal gas constant, is just Boltzmann's constant times Avogadro's number. We're talking about molecules here, so Avogadro's number, and we'll say more about Avogadro's number in just a second, but Avogadro's number takes us from the invisible world to the macroscopic measurable world. We have the most probable velocity, the average velocity, the root mean square velocity. Look that one up. That one's pretty interesting. So, okay, we're doing good because we have definitions for all these quantities now, except for Avogadro's number. So let's take a look at Avogadro's number. The Until recently, the definition of a mole is the number of carbon atoms you need to have to have 12 grams of those carbon atoms. So again, the question, we're going back to this question, what do you want to be defined and what do you want to be measured? What do you want to know with certainty and what do you want to have there be some uncertainty for? Do you want to define what a meter stick is or what a meter is and then have some uncertainty in the measured value for the speed of light? Or do you want to define what the speed of light is and then have some uncertainty in any length piece of wood or piece of brass that you get? So here, what do you want to be certain about? Do you want to be certain about the mass of one mole of carbon atoms. Do you want to say, is if I got one mole of carbon, 12 atoms, I got exactly 12 grams of stuff. And I'm certain about that, and that makes me happy. Or do you want to be absolutely certain about Avogadro's number, to define what Avogadro's number is? Because you understand this, that we could define one mole as the number of carbon atoms needed to make 12 grams, but we don't know exactly what a carbon-12 atom weighs would have to measure that. And by measure, there'd have to be some uncertainty. There's always some uncertainty in the things you measure. There's always certainty in things you define for yourself. So what do you want to have there be certainty for? And what do you want to have there be some uncertainty for? And we can find the value for Avogadro's number. There it is. It's a really big number. It's times 10 to the 23rd. We can find Avogadro's number in a couple of different ways. One way is to do an electroplating experiment and measure carefully the current and measure carefully the time and measure carefully the change in mass of the zinc 
or the copper. And now there's the one I dislike the most. And this is the candela, the measurement for luminous flux. But it's not exactly luminous flux, because if we were talking about luminous flux, we wouldn't be talking about the candela. We'd be talking about lumens, lumens, the energy from light per second. Lumens, that's what you want to look at if you are buying a light bulb. About a thousand lumens, that's a nice bright light bulb. So luminous flux in lumens is the energy from light per second. Luminous intensity measured in candela is the luminous flux divided by 4 pi for some reason that we'll get to in just a second. So the candela. Luminous efficacy. Luminosity is the measure of total energy per second, but we're interested in the energy put out as visible light. We'll define that as having a frequency of 540 times 10 to the 12th hertz. And I guess this makes sense. There's a lot of different frequencies of electromagnetic radiation, and we could have some gamma ray burst from the astronomers that might put out tons of energy, or we could have some active galactic nucleus putting out tons of radio energy and would never be able to see it. So we don't want to just, I guess, talk. I guess it's fair. I shouldn't beat up on the candela. But it's a really strange definition because then we take this energy, not all the energy, just the visible light energy that's emitted, and we find it per solid angle. And the solid angle, which nobody ever uses for anything else, is the steradian, and there are four pi steradians in a sphere. So we can define the candela as 1 683rd of a watt per steradian of 540 times 10 to the 12th hertz electromagnetic radiation. And I wanted to leave out the candela, but then I'd feel bad. So I let the candela come along, and now I feel like, why'd you come? You're just making everything worse. Anyway, to review, we are talking about what is defined and what is measured. Do we want to have the length of a particular meter stick defined or the speed of light defined? And I should note again that most of these changes that I'm talking about occurred in 2018, 2019. This change happened in the mid-20th century, so there's that and I guess that change must have gone pretty well because they're doing the other changes now. Anyway, what do you want to define with certainty? The mass of a particular piece of metal, or do you want to define Planck's constant? What do you want to know with certainty? The temperature of the triple point of water, or Boltzmann's constant? And one thing about Boltzmann's constant, it's good for other things besides just water. And one thing that's good for about Planck's constant is that it's good for more than just one particular piece of metal. And what do you want to know with certainty? The mass of one mole of carbon-12 atoms or the number of items in a mole? And again, I'd say that it's better to know Avogadro's number with certainty because you could have one mole of a bunch of different types of atoms, not just carbon. And again, it sounds like we're doing something a little bit dangerous here. It sounds like we're telling nature exactly what nature ought to be or exactly what the speed of light has to be. But if you carefully follow through how we define everything, everything's defined based on other quantities. So we're not insisting that nature do this, that, or the other thing. We're playing fair. We're just being honest about what we define and what we're uncertain about. And we're okay if we don't know exactly as a scientific community, that we're just going to be okay if we don't know exactly, if we can't define exactly how big that mass is in France, or how long that stick is, or how much the mass is of exactly one mole of carbon-12 atoms. And now it gets worse, and very much more confusing, but very much more interconnected and interesting, because now we'll talk about the strength of the magnetic field around a current-carrying wire, or the charge of an electron. Which would you rather know? Which sounds more basic to you? Which one sounds like a more important thing to know? And now we're going to have to get even further down the rabbit hole here, so hang on. We usually go through, and when I talk about we, I talk about physics textbooks, usually go through these topics as follows. First, we talk about static charge, where you rub plastic against wool and they become electrically charged. Then there's a chapter on current electricity, a chapter on magnetism, it turns out all these things are related, and they're all related to a phenomenon called light. We'll try to explain that very quickly here. So first, if you rub plastic against wool or a balloon against your hair, it will become electrically charged. And we all know that like charges repel each other and opposite charges attract one another. And Coulomb's Law gives the force of that attraction. So there's a couple different ways of writing Coulomb's Law. We have here one with epsilon naught, the permittivity of space. And here is a good equation, but here is a little bit of a problem. Because we don't know what a Coulomb is yet. Charge is measured in Coulomb. So we haven't defined what a Coulomb is yet. And if we know what a Newton is, 
and we know what a coulomb is, then we could measure the permittivity of space. Or if we define what the permittivity of space value should be, and we know what the force value is in newtons, then we can define a coulomb. So once again, we have that same choice of what to measure and what to define, but it gets a little bit more complicated. Right now, anyway, we'll just leave it that we could define the elementary charge or define the permittivity of space, and that's a choice. But we're on to current electricity. We, we made it to the next chapter, on to current electricity. And finally, an equation that isn't so complicated. Current is equal to the charge divided by time. And we know what time is, so if we can find a good unit for charge, we can find a good unit or a good definition of current in amperes. Next, on to magnetism. And when you talk about magnetism, people think about magnets, bar magnets, and that's one way to talk about it. But it's hard to compare different magnets to one another. Is this bigger magnet stronger, weaker, how much? It's easier to talk about the magnetic field around a current carrying wire. A coil of wire will have the same type of magnetic field as a bar magnet, but let's straighten out that coil of wire and just talk about the magnetic field around a straight wire. The equation is mu naught i over 2 pi r. We're not surprised that the stronger the current, the stronger the magnetic field. B is magnetic field in Teslas. And we're also not surprised that the further away r is the perpendicular distance, the further away you are from this wire, the weaker the magnetic field. So, so far that equation is pretty good. There's a pi in there. There's also mu naught, the permeability of space. If you thought the permittivity of space was cool, here's the permeability of space. It involves the strength of the magnetic field. But what is this magnet? How can we figure out what a magnetic field is? Well, when I say field, you should think of forces. And a magnetic field can put a force on a moving, emphasize moving, charged particle or on a current carrying wire. And I'm confused now and I want to go home. But don't worry, we're almost done right here. So we have a definition of magnetic field in Tesla. We have a definition of force. Because with these equations, F equals QVB and F equals ILB, if we're comfortable with force and we're comfortable with charge or current, then we should be okay with magnetic field and we should be able to find the permeability of space. Okay, I think I'm okay. But what does this have to do with light? Well, because James Clerk Maxwell said that light is a electromagnetic wave and he even proved it. That's a whole nother story. But here we have some of those same constants, mu naught and epsilon naught, the permeability and the permittivity of free space showing up in equations for electromagnetic waves and light is a wave. So we're good and we're done, but I got a problem. You said that we could define a coulomb, use that to define an ampere, use that to define a tesla, right? But say I'm in a laboratory and I say to my assistant, please bring me a cup of sugar. Well, they could bring me a cup of sugar. Please bring me a five meter long piece of wood. They could do that. Please bring me 67 grams of carbon 12. They could do that too. Please bring me 52 coulombs of electric charge. What, 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 like, like how would they do that? How would they carry it? Would we define a coulomb as three standardized rubs of a standardized plastic thing on a standardized wool thing? I mean, how would you, like, think about that. How would you define a coulomb? And somebody's thinking, oh, you got coulomb's law. And you know what a newton is? So you just define the permittivity of space, and then you can get a definition of a coulomb. Okay, well, how you want to define epsilon naught? It's it's difficult, and I'm just I'm not trying to make you feel like this is a big, but it is a problem. It, I'm, and then that's the problem that is trying to be dealt with in a better way by these new definitions of some units. So how was this problem dealt with in the 20th century and earlier in the 19th century? Also, well, by observing that if you believe that a current carrying wire creates a magnetic field, and you believe that a wire carrying a current in a magnetic field feels a force, then two wires, both carrying current, should attract or repel one another. Whoa, I promise we're almost done with this electromagnetism stuff. Everybody hates this stuff. I, kinda, I, I can see why. Anyway, so these two wires will either attract or repel one another. So here's what you do. You set up an experiment where you have two long wires, and this was the definition of an ampere. The definition of an ampere for years and years was that constant current which, if maintained in two long straight parallel conductors one meter apart, would produce a force on those wires of 2 times 10 to the negative 7 newtons per meter. And we'll spell meter M-E-T-R-E to show that we are French. And if we're not French, at least somebody else was at some point. So anyway, this is the definition of the ampere, right? Well, kind of, really, it's the definition of mu naught. 
the definition of the permeability of free space. If you look at the equation, F is 2 times 10 to the negative 7 newtons. L is 1 meter. I1 is 1. I2 is 1 ampere. R is 1. So, yeah, we're, what we're defining here, what we're doing, is we're giving an absolute certain value for the permeability of free space. And I like this value. I think it's a shame that it's going away. I like this value because it's it's defined in terms of pi, and we don't know what pi's exact value is, which is great. So I'm going. I get to define this value as anything. I could choose two. I could choose four. I'm going to choose an irrational, even a transcendental number, because that's what they did. Okay. So here's again. We defined mu as four times pi times ten to the negative seven. That was used to define what an ampere is. Since an ampere is a coulomb per second, and we know what a second is, we ha now have the definition of a coulomb. The definition of a coulomb and Coulomb's law can be used to measure, not define, but measure the permittivity of free space. Or just as easily, the definition of a coulomb could be used to measure the charge of an electron. Electrons, of course, have small charges when measured in coulombs, 10 to the negative 19th. And one way to measure the charge of an electron, a famous way, is the Millikan oil drop experiment, where you have oil droplets that are charged, suspended between the plates of a parallel plate capacitor. So that's the Millikan oil drop experiment. So again, the question, what do you want to measure and what do you want to have defined? Do you want to have the charge of an electron defined or do you want to have mu naught? the permeability of free space defined. The old system defined mu naught and measured the charge of an electron, and I submit to you that the new system is better, the one that defines the charge of an electron and measures. And we can no longer call it 4 pi times 10 to the negative 7th. It'd be nice if we could, but we now must use a decimal value for the permeability of space. Now, I mentioned electromagnetic waves and Maxwell's equations, and I didn't do that just to show off. It is relevant to our story because of the equation c squared is equal to 1 over mu naught epsilon naught. So I said earlier that we would have to measure the permittivity of free space, and yeah, that's kind of true, but we'd also know it exactly if we define the speed of light. And if we define mu naught, the permeability of free space, then we would have a defined value for the permittivity of free space, which would be neat. So what do you want to know with certainty? Mu naught and epsilon naught or the elementary charge? It seems like we're losing two perfectly defined quantities to pick up just one. So it seems like we're losing out at this point. Perhaps we'll come out ahead at the end. All right, so the old system to review. The old system defined a hunk of brass, a hunk of metal, and the frequency associated with the cesium-13 atom. And that old system measured the speed of light and measured Planck's constant. The new system still has defined that frequency associated with cesium and now defines the speed of light and defines Planck's constant. You must measure that piece of metal. You must measure that other piece of metal. The old system defined the triple point of water, the mass of one mole of carbon-12 and mu naught, and then measured Boltzmann's constant, Avogadro's number, and the charge of of an electron. The new system defines Boltzmann's constant, Avogadro's number, and the elementary charge. And you must now measure the triple point of water, mu naught. You must measure the mass of one mole of carbon-12. And there they are. The new constants that define the new system. And here these guys are. These poor retired standards. These retired standard objects. These retired definitions. This retired experiment. We have now bold and shiny new constants, and we have retired a hunk of metal, another hunk of metal. One was retired in 2018, one was retired in the 20th century. But we have the changing of the guard, so to speak. So now to review, it used to be all connected, and it is still connected now. We used to have definitions for the meter, the second, the kilogram, the mole, the candela, the kelvin, and the ampere that were based on some definitions and also interrelated. For example, you would need to know in order to define what an ampere was, you would need to, with those long parallel wires, you would need to know what a newton was. And a newton requires a definition for a meter, a second, and a kilogram. Similarly, you would have to know in order to define the candela, you would need to know what energy is. And that also needs the meter, the second, and the kilogram. Obviously, you'd need to know what a kilogram is if you were going to define a mole 
as 12 grams of carbon-12. The new system is also interconnected, and you can see there are more interconnections. And we have retired all the standardized objects, and we have in their place just fundamental constants. Numbers, you don't have to put it in a suitcase. You can put it on a slip of paper. Just numbers, that's all they are. They're just numbers. The definition of a second, a kilogram, a mole, a candela, a kelvin, an ampere, and a meter come from just numbers. Numbers for the speed of light. The frequency associated with cesium-133, a number associated with Planck's constant, with Avogadro's number, with the candela, with Boltzmann's constant, and with the fundamental charge of an electron. So if we know everything, what else is there to find out? Well, that's the excellent question, and that's why I think this new system is just better. It's just better because what what is there for us to just measure what is there left that we'll never be able to know with certainty unless we discover a new symmetry in nature? And that is one of the great hopes for physics, perhaps the great hope of physics, to discover another symmetry, another uniformity, another harmony in nature. Anyway, we need to find out what epsilon naught is. We need to find out or what Coulomb's constant is. We need to find out what the gravitational constant is, Newton's gravitational constant. This is the strength of the electric force and the strength of the gravitational force. We need to find out how these forces relate to one another with ever greater precision. Remember, the earlier system defined epsilon naught, and that's embarrassing. It's embarrassing for epsilon naught to be defined in such a way. You don't know what an electron's charge is with certainty, but you know what epsilon naught is with certainty? Well, that's hogwash, because you don't even know what Newton's constant is with certainty. And there's one other thing that we need to know. We also need to know alpha, the fine structure constant, if we were talking about the relative intensities of the gravitational force and the electric force. The fine structure constant connects and unites the electromagnetic force with the weak nuclear force and takes us even further down the rabbit hole, but we can go there with firmer footing with these new units. Thanks for listening.